My guest this week is Simon Payton Jones. And I have to be kind of careful introducing this one because I could turn into a total fanboy. Simon is an absolute legend. I've got such respect for him. And he's been a huge inspiration for me, as well as hundreds, thousands of programmers. He's been a researcher and groundbreaker in functional programming for decades. He's been one of the key developers and shepherds, possibly even midwives, of Haskell, which is one of my favorite languages. And beyond what you might consider the niche of Haskell, I think you can feel his influence on any language that's been touched by functional programming trends in the past few years. Anything from Java to Python to F Sharp and beyond. He's even, and this is a kind of separate story, but he's even had a big influence on Excel programming. So despite Haskell seeming like a niche, he might have affected more computer users than just about any language researcher ever. In addition to all that, all his computing work and wisdom, he's also one of my all-time favorite conference speakers. I saw him give a talk a few years back about a new technique for optimizing the compilation of let statements. Now, in the hands of literally anyone else, that would be the driest, smallest topic you can imagine. But he has such clarity for explaining things and such raw enthusiasm for programming I left that talk wanting to write a compiler just so I could optimize let bindings. I kid you not, he's that infectious. So I would have gladly had Simon on the show to talk about anything that's on his mind, but we narrowed it down to three big topics. His past. How do you build a language as large as Haskell out of a very small set of core ideas? And what do you put in that core to make it a larger language? Once you've mastered that trick, we get to his present, what he's been doing for other languages. Simon's been working on Verse over at Epic Games. I thought Verse was a high-level scripting language for Unreal Engine, for Fortnite extensions. But it might just be a Trojan horse language for the idea of functional logic programming. What's functional logic programming, you ask? Simon's about to explain to us. And as if his past and present work weren't enough, he's also trying to influence all our futures. He has been heavily involved in shifting the way we teach computing in this country, in England. And he wants to spread that influence far and wide so that children get taught the fundamentals of computing, just like they're taught the fundamentals of maths and sciences. As if all that weren't enough, Simon's also a thoroughly nice chap. So let's get started. I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Developer Voices, and today's voice is Simon Payson Jones. Joining me today is Simon Payson Jones. Simon, how are you doing? Hi, good to see you again. Good to have you here. So I, I was trying to think of how to introduce you and how to pull together all the threads of your career, right? which is a big task. You are, I wanted to say, you you are to functional programming what James Brown was to soul. <laughs> you are in some sense the godfather of functional programming. <laughs> Hardly. There are plenty of other godfathers. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a large family, yeah, but you're from, certainly John up there. John onwards and... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and indeed enough. from Alonzo Church and on. Oh words. gosh, you're going to get all that way back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let's say you're standing on the shoulders of giants, but indeed. you're one of the giants upon whom we now stand. Um, I was trying to pull together a thread that connects what you've done that we could start with, and the one that jumped out at me was you've worked on Haskell, obviously a huge contributor to Haskell. You're currently working on Verse. You are a contributor, or were, to C minus minus, and the yeah. thing that connects all three of those, which is, I think is fairly rare in programming language implementation, is they are a large outer shell, which is a lot of syntactic sugar for a very tightly defined core language. Is that fair um, to say? That's true of Verse and Haskell. I'm not sure if it's so true of C minus minus. C oh, minus minus was designed minus as a minus. kind of portable assembly language, um, okay. Uh, rather like, um, uh, rather like LLVM has um, become, but LLVM has become much larger than C minus <laughs> yeah. was intended yeah. to be. 
Um, but yes, for the um, certainly for I mean, it's a, it's a fairly common pattern uh, to try to uh, to design a, a sort of a, 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 a large user friendly language um, which desugars into some some kind of small elegant core. You seem to have pushed that much further than most of the language implementations I know about. So, I guess the first question is why? Why do it that way? Well, for me, it's a um, um, it's a testament to the uh, expressiveness of the lambda calculus. Right? So, one of the things that always attracted me about functional programming um, is that it's a place where theory and practice come rather close together. Um, so you can build practical programming language that rests very directly um, on some intellectually robust and small and elegant foundations. So in the case of the lambda calculus, it was always um, the, 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 the lambda calculus in, in, its, in its essence is just a, 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 lambda, a lambda term is just a variable, an application or a lambda. Um, and what's amazing is that you can translate an enormous um, variety of programs in, into that. Indeed, uh, um, you could almost imagine two different foundations for computation. This wasn't the way that it happened, but when Alonzo Church and Alan Turing, they were actually in the same university at Princeton at the same time. And Alonzo Church was defining the Lambda Calculus and Turing was defining the Turing machine. Um, and both of them are computationally complete. That is to say, uh, um, if we want to say, what can computers do? Fundamentally, we say, well, they're, they're just Turing machines. If a Turing machine can do it, a computer can do it and vice versa. Yeah. Um, but you can also say um, they're just lambda calculus machines, right? If a computer do it, a lambda term can do it. And in fact, it was entirely non-obvious, but in fact, it turns out that Turing machines and, and lambda calculus are uh, interdefinable. That is, you can write a Turing machine which will run any lambda term, and you can write a lambda term that will run a Turing machine, right? They're equally expressive. Good. Yeah. Um, so now then, it didn't really happen like this, but you can imagine that all of imperative programming is built on Turing machines, right? What's a Turing machine? It, it has this tape and it mutates, um, you know, mutates the tape. It, it, it reads and writes things on the tape. The tape is like the store. Um, yeah. It's fundamentally a mutation machine. What is the lambda calculus? Well, um, at any moment, you have a, a term, a lambda term, and it simply, um, uh, you, and you rewrite it one step at a time. You just keep rewriting, and you get some answer. And this is a completely different model of computation. That's, yeah. um, and functional programming is built on the, that purely functional model of computation. The imperative programming is built on a more um, mutation-based Turing machine style thing. So it's almost as if two entire approaches to programming have grown up um, built on different foundations, but that ultimately, ultimately, they're equally expressive. So, for me, um, I've always loved um, the lambda calculus as a basis for computation, and it turns out that you can translate um, well all sorts of languages, including Haskell, into this very small core. And moreover, the thing that I've appealed to me particularly um, is that uh, that's not just a theoretical idea; it's a practical idea. You can actually build a compiler. Um, that translates into this small core, and moreover, um, the the lambda calculus have, you know had a long history of development, including typed lambda calculi, and in particular, a typed lambda calculus called System F. Um, and it turns right. out that it's not just most compilers typically uh, most compilers in the world typically take a, a language that might be statically typed and translates it to some kind of intermediate language and then optimizes that but the intermediate language is typically not statically typed um, but in ghc our compiler for haskell we take the uh haskell in its um and all its glory and translate it into this core language system f which is statically typed so very unusually ghc is one of the very few production compilers i know that um, maintains a statically typed program from the front of the compiler right through to the code generator i'd not thought of it that way uh, yeah and that's that's incident you might understand you might ask why bother to do that right well <laughs> uh, to do that. because <laughs> after all um all that matters is that the source program is statically typed right and we reject it then but since the intermediate program is statically typed, if the comp if there's a bug in the compiler, a very common, uh, you know, which is rather common because I'm a compiler writer, right? <laughs> then uh, then what happens often is you get a type error in the intermediate code, right? So the compiler has a bug. It optimizes program A into program B. Alas, program B is type incorrect, and when you run it, it will crash. 
Yeah. Right. So if you don't have a typed intermediate language, what happens is you have a bug in your compiler, you compile a program, you try to run the program and it crashes. You think, why does it crash? So you can you know, get GDB out and work out why it's crashes. Then you say, yeah. oh, the code generator is generating the wrong code. Why is that? Oh, because the intermediate program, are, you know, some uh, many levels of transformation back. Ah, the optimizer introduced the bug. The optimizer turned a type correct program into a type incorrect program, which crashes. Now, it's way better for the compiler to say, "Uh oh, I find that I have turned a type incorrect program into a sorry type correct program into a type incorrect program," and report. So that that reports the error immediately. It happens rather than compiling it all the way to machine code, running the machine code, and then having to backtrack up to find the bug in the compiler. Yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense. But th there's there's this thing with like having this tightly defined core, which actually, if I'm right, is fairly small. I mean, it's implementable yeah. reasonably if you've got the knowledge to do it. Yeah. Right? Very small. Um, I'm just thinking, a lot of people come to this idea as being like LLVM, in that there's this low-level, LLVM's not as tightly defined, but I'm just trying to get a sense of where something like GHC's core might appeal to language implementers and people interested in how languages are implemented when they seem to already have this popular thing called LLVM? Well, by the time you get to LLVM, you've already descended several layers of abstraction, right? Compilers typically work at um, various levels of abstraction. So if I've got a, um, you know, a Haskell program, I might say to a programmer, how do I, if I'm trying to explain how it runs, I say, well, you've got this function call, you can replace the call by the body of the function, replacing the arguments of the function with the actual arguments that you passed in the call, right? Now, you just keep doing that, and that's how the program executes. Of course, that's mm -hmm. not really how the program executes, um, but really the program does, you know, machine transfers and pushes things on stacks and has things in registers and stores things in the heap and runs a garbage collector. Um, so, uh, but, but nevertheless, if you want to explain to a programmer how it runs, you might think in this rewriting term, rewriting way. Um, yeah. And indeed, the optimizer works in this rewriting way as well. But to get to LLVM, which is a low-level imperative language, you've now had to say, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to allocate function, you know, closures for as yet unevaluated thunks, and they're going to consist of a pointer to some code together with some free variables, and those are going to be stored in the heap one at a time. And then when they have so, so there's a lot of very low-level operations that mean that doing the optimizations you could do in a rewriting system at a higher level become essentially completely inaccessible by the time you get to the low level right so and this is this is not new right every compiler has this idea of we do some transformations and optimizations using the high level code and then we sort of move down to a lower level closer to the machine mm. um, and at that at that point the high level optimizations become ex essentially inaccessible but new lower level optimizations like which register shall i put it in yeah, become yeah. accessible, right? They were not not expressible in the high level stuff. So the LLVM stroke C minus minus part is really in GHC's back end, right? This the intermediate um, language, this system F like language that I was describing, which yeah. GHC uses mostly. That is the sort of the the, the middle of GHC, the long middle that does lots of right. functional programming kind of optimizations. Does that make sense? So they're very yeah, different yeah, purposes, yeah. is what I mean. It's not the so, one is better than the other; it's just they're different. So we're almost talking about a three-layer lasagna of programming. Yeah, yeah. You take Haskell, you turn it into Core, you optimize, then you turn it into L C minus minus or LLVM, and you optimize some more. Yeah. Right. Okay. So what makes that middle layer, the core, some kind of design sweet spot? Is it that it's got um, a solid theoretical backing, or is it something else? Well. Um, you, it's clear that you want to do some transformations at a high level when you still have the notion of you know first class functions and um, and doing beta reductions um, and so forth. So um, you, you so you could imagine doing that on source Haskell. Yeah, but that wouldn't be much fun because so, because source Haskell has dozens and dozens and dozens of language constructs, all of which are really syntactic sugar for some smaller. Thing, right, so it's much more economical to do a one-off transformation that you know gets rid of twenty constructs in favor of one, and then optimize the one, rather than right. try to optimize the twenty. Right, so, so 
So what you want is to have um, an intermediate language that is that retains all the high levelness that you need for the optimization, right? Without any of the superficial syntactic sugar, right? That's so what makes it the sweet spot. I wonder if if I can ask a similar question the other direction then. So, if in a sense Haskell boil away all the sugar, yeah, <laughs> and you get down to this core. But then you're saying um, the core of GHC is a very expressive language. Could it have been boiled up to a completely different looking language? Is there something about Haskell that pops out of this core language? Or is the core a substrate on which many languages could be built? Oh, no, the core is a substrate on which many languages could be could be built, you know, that look quite unlike Haskell, really. Right. Um, because it's really just just the statically typed lambda calculus. The big thing is that the, 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 the thing that would make, I mean, like, could you take ML, for example, and translate it into core? Well, um, let's see. So uh, uh, mostly you could. Uh, the thing is that, that GHC's core is a lazy language. It has um, core by name semantics. Um, and ML is called by value. Um, and there's quite a lot of research has been done about, could you make a single intermediate language in the style of this core thing that yeah. was equally good for call by value and call by need languages, no, source languages? So right. you compile many, many languages. Thing. I think the answer is probably yes. Um, but the details are quite, it's quite difficult to do a really good job of both at once. And in practice, uh um you know they are uh the haskell's core is skewed towards lazy evaluation though it can it spends a lot of effort on um core by value as well and similarly a compiler like the ocaml compiler that the folks at jane street are building um uh which they have an intermediate language called i think f lambda they call it um Excellent. there they will be skewed towards a uh, call by value Right. So this starts to lead into your current research topic, because I know you're working on another core for another language that has a, a third call semantics. You, you've been working on verse, yeah. which is neither lazy nor strict. It's lenient, is that yeah, Lenient, and also, but also more, even more significantly, it's a functional logic language. So we talked about imperative languages, um, haven't we? Which is, you know, I mean, do this and then do that. Things like yeah. C or Java or Fortran um, or C++. Um, that's a whole it's a whole class of language. Then we've got functional languages, of which Haskell is a, is a particularly, what's the word, um, uh, pure example in that Haskell, Haskell's default mode of computation is purely functional. If you want to do side effects like input-output or mutating variables, you have to use the uh, you know a monad, um, so-called, so that there's a yeah. type system that keeps side effect in computation separate from pure computations. So yeah. uh, whereas ML, doesn't have, ML is mostly functional, but you can have um, side effect in computations as well without delineating them in the types. So we've got imperative programming, Functional programming, both of which, I mean, imperative programming is the mainstream. Yep. Functional programming is the thing to which I have essentially devoted my professional life because I thought it was so cool when I first came across it when I was, you know, uh, 21 or so. Um, and <laughs> I became kind of addicted to it. And I, I didn't think about it like that at the time. But essentially, I've spent my professional life trying to, to say, how can we take the idea of purely functional programming and really make it go? Right, knock yep. down all the practical obstacles that make it hard to do in practice, um, or running too slow or too awkward. Just sort of, you know, crush those obstacles one at a time. Um, and uh, and so that's what I spent my time doing. Haskell is a Haskell is a, um, uh, a the particular vehicle for that research endeavour, if you like. Um, and um, and sure enough, uh, as it turns out, I mean, research endeavours don't often um, succeed in that kind of way. But sure enough, it turns out that Haskell, you know. Or, or on its own has been has become relatively uh, you know successful as in it hasn't died out after thirty years which most you know, most research languages don't last nearly that long um, yep. but also functional programming as an enterprise has proved to be quite influential in the mainstream so uh, languages like and I don't see Sharp and uh, Python and so forth you can see and many other languages you can see absorbing functional language ideas now yeah, yeah. alongside these two right has been functional logic programming. 
Now, that is a much smaller niche. You, if you think functional programming is niche, right? I don't think it's niche. It's a big niche, but nevertheless, it isn't the mainstream. Functional logic yeah. programming is much less popular. I haven't even heard of it. I consider myself fairly well informed. So, yes. yeah. so what's functional logic programming? Well, you've heard of logic programming, like Prolog, right? Um, yeah. And there you have logical variables, and unification is a sort of key concept when you're um, working with Prolog. And you can call, you can make new logical variables, and you can call functions, passing them arguments that are sort of not yet completely filled in. Um, it's a very different approach to programming. Just as functional programming makes you rewire your brain, logic programming makes you rewire your brain too. Yeah. Now, um, Functional logic programming has grew out of an attempt to say, well, logic programming is quite cool and functional programming is quite cool. Could we sort of somehow um, merge them? So one way to think of it is this. In Haskell, um, you can say, let x equal, um, I don't know, uh, um, f of 17 in right. blah, blah, blah. So that says x is a variable that denotes a value, which is the result of f of 17. Right. So, function, yeah. so we that and that, so it does two things. It brings X into scope, and it tells you what its value is. It doesn't tell you the answer of f seventeen. It just tells you, it tells you that to compute its value, you compute f seventeen. Right. right. Yeah. Um, now, uh, but nevertheless, X X stands for just one value in its scope. Right. X doesn't stand yeah. for three and then four. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. Because, like in C, if you say if you bring X into scope, it's a mutable cell that you then assign to, and maybe assign a different value later and a different value later. So X is the name for a box whose value changes over time. In Haskell, yeah. X is a name for a value and only one value. Okay. Now, in a functional logic language, you split the let into two parts. One is one brings X into scope, just says there is an X, right? but says yeah. nothing about its value. And then separately to that, you can have equations that get, that explain something about the value of x. So you can say, you can say bring x into scope, which in um, reverse calculus we say exists x, right? There is an x. <laughs> yeah. And then somewhere in the scope of that exists, you could say x is a pair. So now you've now you've you've given some extra information. You said it's not it's not a number, it's not a string, it's definitely a pair. But you might say, and it's the first and second components of the pairs. I'm not going to tell you. They're just y and z. So you might say, right. exists y and z, x equals the pair y comma z. So you've, as it were, refined the value of x a little bit. Okay. Right? Yeah. And then somewhere else you might say, first of x equals three. Okay. Right. Yeah. And that's saying, oh, um, if you compute first of x, which now we can, since we know that x is a pair, right? Then, then, um, then, and the first component, remember, was y. Then y must be three. That's. Right? I mean, that's a very unusual thing in itself because it almost feels like we're defining the something twice. Well, it's not. We're not. Uh, we're, we're only saying um, if we if we said we could say x equals a, x is the pair y z and elsewhere. You said x equals three. In that case, the program would fail, mm. right? If you give contradictory information about a one of these logical variables, right? You say exists yeah. x, x equals three, x equals five, fail, right? So <laughs> deeply built into the idea of functional logic programming is the idea that a computation may fail, that is, return zero results. And failure is not necessarily bad, Right, failure is um, any more than false is bad, or in Haskell, um, a function a function that returns a maybe value, which is a maybe value is either just x or it's nothing. So a lookup, for example, might return a maybe value. So in Haskell, if you do a lookup and it returns nothing, the value nothing, that's not wrong. It's just that the lookup didn't find you know the the key in the dictionary. That's yeah. fine. Programming's like that. That's what, you know. That indeed, that, that might be partly what you want to do. Um, so, um, so in in verse and in functional logic programming, failure is not um, like uh, you know seg fault crash. Bad things happen. Yeah, um, it's not a moral judgment. It's just there correctly is no answer to that. There correctly is no answer. That's right. In fact, yeah. verse and indeed um, a very old language called Icon um, did this same thing. In verse, there are no booleans. Instead, you say if you say if e then you know then branch else else branch, then the semantics is 
if we evaluate E and E fails, we take the else branch. Right. If there's if, no possible answer to E. Yes, exactly. Then, yeah. So that, that's in just, just like I say in Haskell, if you call the lookup and then you can pattern match on the result, and if it's nothing, you do this. If it's just X, you do that. In inverse, you can just say, if the thing fails, take this branch. Otherwise, take that branch. So failure is not, it's not bad. Anyway, so, um, so in this functional logic programming paradigm, you've got um, uh, deeply wired into the very fabric of computation. It's the idea that a computation may fail, return zero results. Um, mm. And in fact, um, inverse, it can also return many results. So that's a, the, the, another crucial component of functional logic programming is choice. Um, so the expression one vertical bar two returns one and then two, right? So an expression can yield zero results. We call that failure. One result, or maybe two results, or maybe seven results. Um, so this sort of uh, multiplicity of results is part of the core computation model of verse. So as you can see, it's very different to to ordinary functional programming. Yeah, I, I know someone is listening to this is going to be thinking this, so I have to ask it. In what way is this not just processing lists? Lists well, of input, um, lists of it is. It is a bit like making um, you know Haskell's list monad into the fundamental monad of the language, right? mm. <laughs> um, but. Um, and you could simulate verse by, uh, it wouldn't just be a list monad, it would be a logic T monad for anybody who wants to go and look up the logic T library or something a bit like that. Because remember, we've got to do all this unification as well. Uh, yeah, that's right. the big difference. So, um, uh, so a functional, uh, well, well, so one possibility would be to say, well, why don't we just do all this as a library? Well, the answer is it would be it, it would be possible but inconvenient, right? Programs would look cluttered. Um, yeah. uh, another way to ask the question is, what is the core computational paradigm of this functional logic thing, right? Could we, as we were saying, as we can distill Haskell down into Lambda Calculus, what would we distill Verse into? And right. this has been your, your job recently, right? That is my job That's recently. Question, That's right. Yeah. So, so if we're going to do this functional logic programming thing, we'd better know what our, you know, uh, what the the absolutely essential, irreducible essence of functional logic programming is. If we're go if we're going to undertake this endeavor at all, um, and we are. Um, so indeed, we spent the last um, couple of years um, uh, identifying uh, what we called the verse calculus. Um, mm. There was a paper at um, ICFP last year about it, um, which indeed describes a little calculus. It's it's bigger than the Lambda calculus, quite quite a bit bigger actually. Lambda calculus, remember, at its core only has you know variables, applications, and lambdas. That's incredibly sparse, right? Yeah. Verse has about you know eight. So the the verse calculus has about eight constructs or something. It's a bit bigger. Um, <laughs> But we've also found a very nice way to then give it semantics in a similar style that we give the semantics of the Lambda Calculus. How do we say what a Lambda Calculus program means? We give it rewrite rules, in particular, beta reduction. Um, so in the verse calculus, we give it rewrite rules too. Yeah, you, I think you need to define beta reduction for those that don't know. Yes. So um, uh, so it's a bit difficult to do this without a whiteboard. But what is what is a, what is a um, the only... In, when Alonzo Church first defined the Lambda calculus, he defined this incredibly tiny calculus, which is um, just variables, applications, and lambdas. And the only the only rewrite rule is if you have a lambda applied to an argument, think about a function applied to an argument. Mm -hmm. Then what do you do? You take the body of the of the function, and you replace the call with the body, having replaced the bound variable with the actual argument. So you're sort of rewriting the function to be... You're rewriting the function call yeah. to have a copy of the function body. Yeah. So if I have, um, I don't know, if I say um, one bat of x is x squared plus one, then if yeah. I see one bat of three, I can replace that with three squared plus one. If I see one bat of 77, I replace that with 77 squared plus one. Yeah. Right. So each call is replaced by a copy of the body um, with the actual argument substituted for the formal parameter. That is beta reduction. That step of replacing the call by the copy of the body after substituting, that's beta. 
Right. Um, and astonishingly, that single thing is enough to define a computationally complete language. That is a, you know, a, a, uh, it's enough to define any computation whatsoever in the, you know, in the Turing complete sense. It's amazing that that one rule is enough. That, that's punching massively above its weight. <laughs> it is amazing, right? Yeah, that, yeah. It's, you know, it's just gobsmackingly brilliant that Alonzo Church, right back in the, you know, late 1920s, early 1930s, was defining this calculus with, with a single rule Define something that was as expressive as a Turing machine. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they're in- into expressive. It's not too surprising that we figured out how useful that was from Turing side, building machines upwards. But yeah, but it's interesting that now time has rolled on and we've realized that you can go from the maths down to get it to exactly the same place. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they, they realized that they were into, um, you know, they, they were each as expressive as the other. They realized that very early on. Um, but the thing about Turing machines is that real machines, you know, actual, you know, what, what, whatever it is, you know, x86 processors, they look much more like Turing machines yeah. in which the memory is the tape that is mutated by the processor that is like the head of the Turing machine. So there's quite a close connection between um, your Turing machine model of computation and what really happens in our microprocessors. Yeah, yeah. And the, the sort of functional programming stuff has taken a bit longer to say, well, it's equally expressive, but if we build a good compiler, we can map it onto the same x86 processor. Yeah. Um, and that is the that actually is the step we were discussing earlier when we go from Lambda Calculus down to LLVM or C minus minus. Yeah. Okay. So going back to um, this core, which I really want to explore more, boiling down... We've got to go high level in a second, but boiling down this uh, functional logic programming language into verse core, you've called it, you've ended up with a batch of, uh, you say, eight rules. Oh, no, though we have, a, I think, I forget the exact number. We have, a, a, a alas, rather more than eight rules. There's oh, more okay. like 20 or so, I think. I can look at the paper, but the I was meaning the, the number of syntactic constructs. Oh, the okay. calculus yeah. only three or four. We have more like sort of eight or ten, I think, in the verse calculus. Okay, but this core—I mean, does it? The thing, one thing I want to know is: can you look at the two different cores and get a sense of what the final language is going to feel like to work with? I mean, does does it have? <laughs> is there functional logic Zen, the fun, the Tao of it, buried yeah. in this core language? Oh, there is. I mean, I think I think it's. Uh, it, a core calculus is the sort of the essence of what computation means in, in that paradigm. Incidentally, the lambda calculus is a subset of the verse calculus. Um, oh, is it? Yeah. So oh. every lambda term is a verse calculus term. Um, so it's just that the verse calculus has you know a bit more. That doesn't make it computationally more powerful, because we know that the lambda calculus is computationally complete. But it but it has these additional you know functional logic features built into its infrastructure and rewrite rules to support them um, but indeed i think when you stare at the rewrite rules if you look at the you look at the paper you'll get uh you will you will get you know some sense of you won't get a sense of what it's like to write um you know programs in inversed in the large but i think you'll get a sense of what what um uh what computation means and what what you can say in this little little language and what we're saying is i get the sense is a version of programming where there's so imperative languages you define what needs to be done functional languages you define what is it feels like the verse you're going to be defining the shape of things as best you know them now and gradually building up a picture of the constraints around the answer yeah um, that's a bit like that and in some ways that's an even higher level right we, we, so that functional in functional programming, we say it, it's declarative. What do we mean by declarative programming? Like it's what you were saying, what is rather than um, you know how to compute it. Mm. Um, so uh, you know, crudely, you might say imperative programming, you say how, and in functional programming, you say what. And we've you know rather <laughs> sloppily said, well, that must be better, right? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it kind of, but but um, uh, but in oh. a functional logic language, you're even higher level rather than saying. Um, how can I give an example? If I say, um, uh, find me the x such that x squared is is um, 22, mm. then I'm asking you to find the square root of x, 
right? So that's a very yeah. high level thing, right? It's not a square root algorithm. It's completely non-constructive, right? It simply tells you a property of the number you want. Yeah. Right? But it's very expressive. That's good, right? And, and yeah. you, you can see immediately what it does. If I showed you a square root algorithm, it would be hard to figure out what it does. If I just say my spec is, uh, you know, the x such that x squared is um, uh, 22, then you say, ah, oh, now I know what you're doing. Right. Yeah. So this kind of um, tell me the properties of the result way of describing what you want a computer to do, because after all, that's what programming is. Mm. Describe the uh, properties of the result is a rather high level way to tell your computer what to do. All right. As we've seen from this x squared thing. Now, um, yeah. in verse, you can say. Um, exists x, x squared equals 22, and try to run that. But it will get stuck. Right? Why? It's not, it's not an illegal program, but, it, but it's, one that, um, it's one that we can't um, – uh, we can't, we're not going to succeed in executing, right? Because the, the property we've asked it to figure out is too hard. We've asked <laughs> it to guess a square root algorithm, right? Yeah, yeah. But if I okay. say um, – uh, uh, it, an, an x and y and z such that x is the pair y z and um, and the first component of x is three and the second component of x is four. Then I've given you enough information, very straightforwardly, to solve those equations and say, ah, oh, y must be three, z must be four, and x must be the pair three four. Yeah. Right. So the um, uh, uh, so so versus if you, if you like um, a bit on a higher level in the, in this sort of continuum of expressiveness than purely functional programming, but not as high level as, oh, I can just ask you to do, you know, solve um, arbitrary polynomials or, <laughs> yeah. or solve is, Fermat's last problem. Yeah. <laughs> there is a danger that we're going to ask it to um, solve the MP complete problem for us, right? You know, um, can you... <sighs> Give it, oh, give it the traffic yeah. sales problem as the spec and expect the answers to just magically pop out and that's not going to happen. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. the latter part, exactly, yeah. So what is, what is from um, a questions this can answer conveniently point of view, what is functional logic programming good for? Ah, yes, so that's, that's a good question, right? So, so then the, the um, uh, uh, we've got imperative programming, we've got functional programming, we've got functional logic programming. I've always thought that you know since i was 20 i've thought well functional programming is just the right way to write programs right um mm. and um it was very inspiring when john Backus, when he got the turing award gave this lecture called can programming be liberated from the von neumann style in which he was essentially saying he a famous person was saying look i have no truck with these imperative languages just go gangbusters on functional programming because it's a better way to do the job right in the task of telling a computer what you want it to do functional programming is just better um that is to say you're less likely to make mistakes um you'll be more productive and um uh, maybe our programs will be a, who knows it depends how hard we work on a compiler maybe our com maybe our programs will run a little slower but maybe not much um and maybe they'll be highly parallel who knows so but it's just a better way to do the job now um Functional logic programming, maybe that's a better way to write programs. Right? Maybe it's just um, – so I've argued that it's more expressive. That to say it's more expressive and higher level, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a better programming medium because it might be extremely obscure, for example, or hard to understand programs for some reason. Yeah. So I think that the um, – um, Tim Sweeney, my boss, and the uh, founder and chief executive of um, 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 Epic, uh, Epic Games um, – Yeah firmly believes that functional logic programming is just the right way to write programs in the same way that I firmly believed, you know, age 20, uh, yeah. that functional programming was just the right way to do things. Um, and I've, you know, placed my bets on that. And Tim is putting his money on functional logic programming. At the moment, I think there's a, um, uh, I think that's a, uh, the good thing about that is it means that verse takes a view, right? It yeah. is expressing a, 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 strongly held and well-worked-out view of what programming should be like. Um, so that's quite exciting for me as a programming language researcher. Um, is it? Do we know that it's going to be a better way to write programs, even supposing programs run fast enough and so forth? Um, yeah. Is it a better way to write programs? Um, I don't know. It could be. But I think we'll get a lot of The only way we'll really find out is by trying it. And that's what we're doing. 
Um, yeah. So, okay. uh, so Tim is convinced. I'm. Um, uh, I think there's a uh, a extremely interesting you know experiment to be done here, um, and I'm prepared to be convinced. Um, but I'm not yet in the. This is just definitely so much better camp. Yeah. Well, that's fair because um, you are on the spectrum of um, language researcher to marketing person. You're way over the first end of the spectrum, right? Oh, indeed. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's right. I'm, you know, my principal goal in all of this is a, a sort of, it's an intellectual adventure. <laughs> yeah. But of course, the intellectual adventures are uh, dramatically informed by practical usage. I'm strongly motivated by the fact that hundreds of thousands of people using use Haskell. And mm. I'm strongly motivated by the fact that, motivated by the fact that verse, um, because it's going to be the programming language in which you um, enter the, you know, epics, meta, uh, Fortnite world and um, metaverse, uh, there's a, a kind of captive audience there yeah right of actually hundreds of millions of people <laughs> who will start using verse um, and that's very motivating too because i want it to be a language that is you know just works for them and is um uh and is you know smooth and uh and it you know it's just sort of obvious what it does uh I, whether we'll whether we'll succeed in doing all of those things we'll have to see but that's that's the aspiration and we do have a big user base um yeah, it's it's reminding me of Objective C when Apple decided that you had to write Objective C to use iOS. It's like an entire world of programmers just popped up, having to find out how useful and interesting this was. And we're going to see the same with Verse and Unreal Engine, I expect. The yeah, I think so. I mean, you can at the moment you can program with Unreal using C plus plus. Um, that has its own barrier to entry, um, yes. mm. and you can also use a, lang a visual language called Blueprints, um, which is uh, you know it's, it's a visual language in the sense that it, you draw boxes and arrows between them, and the arrows can be data flow arcs, they, or could, they can be control flow dependencies. Um, yeah. But of course, there's a there's somewhat a limit about about what sort of programs you can write in Blueprints. So then you have to descend to C plus plus and verses, sort of filling the gap in the middle. Yeah. Because there's enormous numbers of users. I mean, if you've got 300 million people are, you know, floating about in the um, the uh, sort of Fortnite universe, uh, only a very, very tiny minority of those will uh, uh, um, uh, bite the C++ bullet. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but we hope that a lot more of them will find Verse a happy place to play. Yeah, I can imagine a lot of people getting started with a visual language, hitting the limit, but not quite wanting to leap up the mountain to C++. Yeah. Okay, so let me let me um, ask this. I'm not asking you to bet on the marketing side, but here you are, uh, an experienced language researcher, being told, "Okay, we've got this language verse. It's a functional logic language. We would like you to boil this down to something semantically rigorous." What's it like to retrofit semantics to an existing language? Oh well, it's quite entertaining actually, but and it's entertaining because um, Tim, uh, mm. who is the progenitor of verse, right? The the unique single progenitor of verse, mm. um, he is fundamentally a geek, right? <laughs> he cares cares primarily about um, beauty and elegance, and you know uh, a deep connection to mathematical logic and just doing it right. Um, he has incidentally astonishingly built a very successful company right so he's also a very good businessman yeah um, yeah that's but i would say that his sort of you know genetic core is <laughs> let's do this right so um and he has been designing verse in his head for the last two decades oh really that it's long? just that he's built also yes a long time a long time is also he's been well, busy making um, epic successful as well so <laughs> it's been a kind of you know uh evenings and weekends activity for him for ages and ages mm -hmm. um uh and so um so uh, my job is as it were to uh to figure out what verse is you know what this thing in his head is um, yeah. And it's full of interesting and original ideas, um, and then try to make sense of it all. Now, uh, supposing we discovered it just doesn't make sense. Well, we ha we haven't discovered that yet. But <laughs> I'm I'm uh, I I firmly believe that if we could persuade Tim that something really didn't make sense, he would say, "Oh, chaps, we can't possibly do that." Right? <laughs> <laughs> but you must uh, have found that. 
as you dive right into the very guts of it, you find that actually this piece doesn't fit with this piece unless we amend the language. There, there must be inconsistencies that you only discover when you're trying to formalize something. Well, we are formalizing from the bottom up. So, you know, we're sort of starting with the, you know, the core calculus. That's what this, um, mm. uh, this paper is about. Um, but um, Tim has been thinking about this long, t uh, a long time. So the, 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 um, uh, the whole thing, the whole enchilada, including uh, its type system and verification and transactional memory and side effects um, and uh, classes and inheritance and so forth and, and backward compatibility, the whole thing is jolly complicated. Yeah. Um, so um, I guess what I mean is once you formalize this calculus and you start building up that tower, are you going to find you end up with something that kind of, that doesn't quite look exactly like verse you know say okay there's a new release of verse and we've got to change the semantics because yeah, the, I, don't, the I don't know so, so far we haven't okay, uh, okay. so we have far we haven't come across right. any insuperable obstacles as it were which i think is also also testament to um tim's sort of single single-mindedness um I, i'm reminded incidentally of rust here um mm. uh rust was a language that was um, designed with you know a strong attention to sharing and borrowing and linearity and so forth um, and but it was designed it was very much didn't come out of a university and a sort of pointy headed academic it came out came out of a sort of a desire to to do good practice um, mm. so I was pretty sure that when somebody came to do the theory behind rust right they would find all sorts of holes in the type system. Mm. Right, maybe not ones that uh, occurred in practice very much, but just that there would be, you know, uh, uh, holes in which which would allow you to write programs in Rust that simply weren't correct. You know, that were uh, disobeyed Rust's um, what's guarantees. Yeah. Astonishingly, that turned out not to be the case. Derek Dreyer and his colleagues have done a lot of stuff on the foundations um, of Rust and actually didn't find any major, uh, you know theoretical inconsistencies um that's amazing that, that means great. that the original designers uh had incredibly you know good intellectual not just taste but they actually got it right it's an amazing thing which is jolly complicated this business about linearity and sharing very difficult to get right um it's it's a remarkable achievement i think do you have any theories on why that might be do you think it's just lightning struck? They're just very hardworking and clever, or do you think there's something about computers keeping us honest? Uh, no, I think they're probably just uh, well. I, I, computers do keep you honest, but there's an awful lot of potential programs, possible programs that you could write, sure. um, and many of them, you know, might have uh, you know linearity flaws in them that were not really apparent or don't show up even when you run it. So, so no, I don't think it. Um, I, I think it's just they're e extremely clever and had very, very well educated intuitions that they okay. sort of developed over time. And so you must be claiming something similar for verse if you're going to formalize these things and finding there aren't right. that. Uh, what I'm saying so, so far, as I say, Tim's, Tim's intuitions have proved remarkably, uh, you know, one might disagree about matters of taste, right? So is it worth having this, this piece of complexity in order to allow that kind of expressiveness? You know, you can make choices about that. <laughs> yeah. But what we haven't found is the thing is just a mess and doesn't hold together at all. It's just inconsistent in some right. way. Um, yeah. So, and I think that is testament, as I say, to his single-mindedness uh, yeah. and his sort of technical intuition. Okay. Well, in that case, let's talk about climbing this ladder a bit more because um, I, I absolutely don't want to sit a test on this. But I have read the verse core paper and enjoyed it, and you hint that you're going to be climbing up into formalizing side effects and yeah. types. Yeah. How's that work going? Oh well, so. Um, let's talk about types because that's really the the next big thing. Um, right. So, um, so versus type system is very unusual. Uh, so usually, um, like in a language like Haskell, you have the world of terms, and then separately you have the world of types. Um, and types are, you know, a somewhat special language. In particular, you can statically reason about types. So the type checker can say this program is well typed, this program is not well typed. Hmm. Now, in verse, uh, a type is more like a contract in scheme. So a type oh. is actually just a function, a function in verse, actually. Um, and it's a function which uh, 
either fails in the sense we've been discussing, given an argument, it either fails, or let's say for now, or it's the identity function. So the int type is just the function that takes a value, tests whether it's an int, and if it is, it returns it, and if it isn't, it fails. Make sense? Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost like a filter, if you like. Um, yeah. It just, but it, but it fails if it isn't the type. So um, let's see. The type int comma int, the type of pairs of ints, is a function that takes an argument, um, checks that uh, it is a pair. If not, it fails. Then applies int to the first component, and applies int to the second component. Remember, apply to means check that it has that type. Because mm. int is a function. So, so the pair int comma int is also a function. Is also a type which which does this thing. Right? So okay. any so um, uh, you can define the type say of pairs in which the second component is bigger than the first. Oh, That's okay. That's an unusual type. That is. It's just a function that takes an argument. I mean, you could write this function in verse, right? Just a just a function that takes an argument, checks if it's a pair. If it is a pair, check that the first component is an int. Check that the second component is an int, and then check. That the first component is bigger than the second, and fail right. if not. So it becomes very much that there's a unification there between type statements saying we constrain these values to these rules, and logic pro functional logic programming in general saying we constrain these values to these rules. Th there's there's less of a separation between those worlds. Yeah, maybe, but I think I think it's I think in the type connection, I think is that uh, a type is just a partial function, partial in the sense that it can fail. So remember, we said failure is deeply built into the fabric, mm. and we could make that you know done by some kind of list monad, but then it'd be much more awkward to say, and types do this. <laughs> so so here, um, that's what a that's what a type does. But now, since a type is just um, you know, since I can write new types, new types are just new functions that I write as a user. Mm. Right? So I don't write have a different language for defining new types. New types are simply ordinary old verse function definitions. But that means that the type checker has to understand, well, these ordinary old verse function definitions you've just written. So the type checker has to be to run verse programs. Exactly. This, yeah. <laughs> the type checker has to be able to run verse programs, yes. And of course, you might write something that is extremely hard to check, right? So um, uh, it would not be difficult to write a program with a, a contract you know, or type that was sufficiently mm. complicated that it was hard to be sure that the first argument was going to be bigger than the second. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know, um, uh, say you had a type that was true only of positive numbers. And you said, is x squared in that type? <laughs> well, yes, it is, because we know that, um, if, I mean, if x is an int, we know that squares are always positive. Yeah. But that's a property of numbers, right? So maybe the verifier knows about that property of numbers. But you can cook up some more difficult property of numbers. <laughs> the, 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 so you can see you'd rapidly get into arbitrary theorem proving. Yeah, yeah. Right? So instead of calling it type checking, we call it verification. Okay. And the idea is still going to be that just as the, the purposes of type checker is to say it eliminates certain classes of bugs. So the slogan is, well-typed programs don't go wrong. We're going wrong means some particular class of errors like adding an integer to a Boolean, right? Haskell means you can't, that could never happen at runtime, right? Yeah. So if you imagine a runtime which manipulated integers and Booleans are sort of tagged values so you could tell them apart at runtime, and then your addition operation did a runtime test, you would know that that runtime test would never fail. Yeah. Right? And therefore, yeah, yeah. you can omit all those runtime tests and indeed the tags that distinguish integers from Booleans, right? Yeah. Good. Now, in ver Verse is going to be like that in the sense that um, verified programs don't go wrong. Right? So if the verifier says thumbs up, your program is verified, then a certain class of errors cannot occur. 
right. and the implementation could be corresponding more efficient. But it's possible that the verifier might say, I'm sorry, I can't prove that your program verifies because it requires me knowing, say that uh, X squared is always positive, And I haven't been taught that yet. So over time, I expect the verse verifier to get more powerful, more smarter. Right. Yeah. As it's taught rules for more and more complex time. Exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah. there won't be, unlike Haskell, there won't be a clean, bright line between programs that can be verified and programs that can't. Yes. Right. Because it'll be a function of just how smart has the verifier become. Yeah. On any yeah. one day, we might hope to characterize as precisely as possible where that boundary lies, but it is a boundary that will move over time. Do you think that verifier will ever be user? manipulatable in that you will write more rules for the verifier again in verse? Oh, possibly. Um, yes. I mean, you want to be a bit careful because if the user adds a rule that is simply false, then, you know, the program might crash. Yeah. Um, and it might crash in a truly horrible way, right? So, um, like, it might just simply be a seg fault. Um, yeah. So you'd want to be a bit careful about allowing you... But, but if you... Um, uh, if you essentially add some you know some new things to the verifier that says make this part of the trusted code base if this is wrong all bets are off then that's a pos imaginable possibility yeah 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 okay and do you think i mean i'm thinking verse if if the verifier is just more verse functions <clears throat> yeah this leads into side effects i could in theory define a type which was the the type of all strings which are a valid username in my database. And yes, that's yes, that's right. That might vary over time or space, and who knows. So, so I think for us, types are going to be pure functions. Yeah. So now yes. we need an effect system, right? To ensure that. To, um, so that we can check that um, uh, types are pure functions. And indeed, Verse has an effect system too. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see why it gets complicated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, where are you on um, formalizing the effect system? And are you taking a similar approach to Haskell? Not a similar approach to Haskell because um, uh, Haskell uses these monad things, mm. right? Um, we don't want to you know, get snelled up with monads and types. Um, so, uh, and, and because, um, yes, from a programmer convenience point of view, just being able to say relying on sort of left to right sequencing for side effects is extremely convenient. Um, mm. So, uh, and languages broadly classify into languages like Haskell that force you to do you know do use use monads for anything side effecty, and that's a bit of a hair shirt, but um, it's an excellent discipline in my humble opinion. But but it's a it's a design choice. Another possible design choice is like Verse to. Um, uh, to make a not to make such a strong syntactic and type level distinction between the side effecting computations and, and not ones, but instead have an effect system that says that the, the verifier will for any uh, for any term it's going to be able to um, check whether it's pure. Uh, and you can see fundamentally, you know, crudely put, that's not very hard, right? Is this expression pure? Well, does it use any side effects directly? Mm. And does it cause any call any functions that can use side effects? Yeah, right. So at its crudest level, you can see there must be some kind of purity checker that isn't very hard. Yes, right. But to do a systematic job of an effect system is indeed um, quite a challenge, and that's part of what we're up to at the moment. Yes. Um, it and indeed, like you, you know, I should say, by the way, um, that Tim has an implementation of all of this um, embedded in you know uh, his his C plus plus implementation of us. He's written in C plus plus a compiler that he's been developing over the last twenty years, right. um, and it's um, it's only uh, five or ten thousand lines of C plus plus. It's incredibly small. He is a okay. virtuoso C plus plus programmer, um, but uh, um, but I think he would be the first to admit that it's. Um, you know, it makes an amazingly good stab at all of this, but it is not, uh, you know, uh, tight and elegant and complete and definitely right um, in every particular. So it's an excellent stab, uh, and it means that we have it's – it's a way that he has been using to educate his intuitions. To go back to your question about computers keeping you honest, I think building that has indeed educated his feedback cycle throughout. Um, right, but yep. where, as it were, we're not building directly on that. We're trying to use that as a source of inspiration. 
to do this more foundational thing that we're talking about. Yeah, and that presumably is going to occupy you for a good few years to come. Um, I think so. Though in some the 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 um, the scary bit is that we are designing the airplane at the same moment as we're launching it into the sky, <laughs> right? Because yeah, verse, is now available there is a there is a verse that has been released as a product. If you just you know Google for verse language, you know Epic, you'll rapidly get to it. Yeah, it is a. Um, it doesn't have any of this functional logic stuff in it, but it does have other things like classes, inheritance, and modules. Um, so it's a so it's a language that um, uh, is already usable for building, you know, games and um, creative uh, stuff in the sort of Fortnite universe. Um, and uh, programming gets unreal. So it's already being used by thousands of people. So we're doing this foundational thing on the side. And then, so we're, we sort of launch one, to mix metaphors, we launch one rocket you know, into orbit. And now we're you know, building some more elaborate and sophisticated thing. We're going to launch into orbit. Then we're, they're going to join up in the sky. And hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> we, we will. Um, so, so the scary bit is that we need to do that quickly enough um, that we're, you know, we we can't go on for years and years and years doing this foundational stuff because um, you know the 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 airplane is flying in the sky. We want to we want to meet up sooner, you know, within uh, a year or two rather than in ten years. So right. yes, I think working out all these technical details and writing papers about them will occupy us for several years. Um, but there is a pretty big urgency at the same time that I personally find a bit scary. I can understand that. And do you? One last question then. Do you think that? Do you think that these ideas will be pinned particularly to verse, or are there juicy things that other language designers could pull out of this and steal? Oh, well, um, I mean, the, one of the whole purposes of writing the paper <laughs> is to distill the essence, right? So, of course, any particular language implementation will be encrusted with particulars, right? Haskell is no exception, by the way. It's an enormous language and with a lot of detail to it. And you need to get to know its ecosystem and Cabal and Stack and um, um, HLS and on and on, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, and Verse will similarly be encrusted with lots of stuff. But if we want to, um, uh, you know, the purposes of, of the purpose of uh, sort of the research um, enterprise is to isolate the key ideas and distill them into a form that they can be digested by other, other language designers and academics, right? Um, right? And so indeed, it is my goal um, that um, our, you know, our first paper and hopefully subsequent papers about um, verse and the verse calculus will be influential, will, you know, will be much more than just saying, well, this is how verse works, right? <laughs> will, yeah, they, yeah. They, but they will rather embody and and make precise a collection of ideas that may you know i hope who knows um have be influential in their own right yeah yeah as a language researcher your um your goal is to make the ideas bigger than any one language oh uh, indeed yeah yeah indeed yeah. often when when talking to um research students about writing papers i often say that you know that the 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 uh the least durable thing that we do is to build artifacts, you know, like compilers in my case. Yeah. Um, the most durable thing we do is write papers, uh, right? Because those papers will be, um, you know, in, in the best case, will be uh, read and will in, inform stuff uh, decades later when, the, you know, when the, the particular language implementation is dust. I mean, just look at the fact that we're still, you know, Alonzo Church's ideas we are talking about in the podcast today, which is, you know, a hundred years since he was first thinking about them. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. When we go to a concert hall, we listen to people reading Mozart's papers. He called them symphonies, but they are, <laughs> yeah. you know, his, you know, intellectually written down stuff and uh, symphony orchestras uh, read them. And of course, there's a great deal of expressiveness and nuance in what they <laughs> yeah. do. But the fact is that. Mozart infected our brains with an idea that we still find rewarding. Um, yeah, and I think the the um, you know the purpose of uh, uh, research papers, in some ways, is is to in infect the brain of the reader with a, an idea that is so persuasive and seductive and exciting and creative and interesting that they can then use it to inspire and build on new things. That's the, that's 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 my hope. Yeah. yeah, we had um, we had a guest a couple of weeks ago who was um, hoping to build a version of C that would last a hundred years. But ah. I and I I I um, 
I certainly hope he succeeds, but what I can definitely see is some of the ideas you've been percolating up still being discussed 100 years from now and inspiring new languages. Yeah, I think, it's, uh, I think yes. Languages are surprising. Programming languages actually are an example of something that can be surprisingly long-lived, like COBOL is still alive and well. Yeah. But not in a good way, um, <laughs> I think. <laughs> right, so, um, you know, it's not, it's not, COBOL is no longer a, a source of in, inspiring ideas, just that we have so much code written in it, we have to still, you know, run those compilers. Um, yeah. So I suspect that if um, you know Haskell is still around in a hundred years, it would be not in a good way, right? Whereas I hope the ideas might be, you know, visibly embodied in some more wonderful thing that we have worked out by then. Yeah, yeah. You'd hope that the ideas there are fundamental enough that they'll outlive the programs and us, right? Which actually leads me to the other big arm of your work, which is passing the big ideas on to the next generation. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, computing education super important and a bit and we i think we as a you know as a what's the word as a professional community um we owe it to not to our discipline and in particular to our children to be thoughtful about what our you know what should our children be learning about our discipline um and um in a, in a way that would make them you know, empowered citizens and uh, ones who think it's just the most exciting thing since sliced bread, which it is. Um, <laughs> and let's not put up with uh, an education that's sort of substandard in that respect, which is um, – so, so I you... think it's uh, – there's an endeavour that we should all be involved in in some way. Um, Where would you go with that? Because I'm thinking of my own children's computer science education – it's a bit of Python, a bit of squeak, and too much Excel and PowerPoint. Yes, well, it's probably a bit better than it was, right? So um, when we started computing at school, CAS, the um, organization that is, is sort of behind a lot of the changes in the curriculum, um, the, the national curriculum said you should do ICT, Information and Communication Technology. It was mm. very technology-focused, um, and that is, it was all about artifacts and not about ideas, to go back to mm. that conversation, right? Um, and uh, and it was often no more than learn PowerPoint and Excel. Excel, if you were lucky, <laughs> PowerPoint and Word. <laughs> so then um, uh, over the, the next sort of five to eight years following about 2007, we managed to um, re reposition the UK's national curriculum to state explicitly that children should, all children, should learn the fundamentals of computer science in the same way that they learn the fundamentals of natural science. So that mm. reimagines computer science not as a narrow, sort of rather vocational operational skill that's useful for operating computers, but rather as a foundational discipline like maths or like physics, um, that an elementary understanding of which is kind of essential for understanding the natural world that surrounds you and being a citizen in it who can, you know, have some agency, right? Some ability to influence events, some understanding of what's going on, ability to make informed choices and to make well-judged, you know, well-judged decisions. Do you think there's a parallel? I mean, one of the big reasons we teach children science is not so they can use a Bunsen burner, but so they can think critically. Yeah. And, but it's not just it, – it's a bit more than just think critically. They also need a knowledge base. Mm. Right? If you knew nothing about heat, combustion, mass, mass, velocity, uh, nothing about any of that, but you were very good at critical thinking, <laughs> right? It's just your, you know, your logical processes were good, but you yeah. had no knowledge. That wouldn't, it wouldn't be any good, right? You need to have an elementary you know, understanding of how to think logically, yes, the scientific method, all that, but you also need to know some science facts. Right? <laughs> Otherwise, how can you possibly make informed choices about, I don't know, global warming or about whether it's safe to replace the, you know, to unscrew the, the front of your electric light switch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, in the same way, I think for, um, I, I think the sort of critical thinking and you know, logical thinking, absolutely part of computer science. Indeed, computers are rather good at training you um, to think logically, because they they are so non-judgmentally but absolutely brutally cruel about exposing flaws in your logic. 
that yeah. program just yeah. doesn't work. Um, and it doesn't say, oh, I'm, I feel sorry for you today. I'll make it work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it Which is good when it's uh, controlling the plane that's about to land you. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, but so I think just as you need to, uh, I think all children should learn some, some elementary aspects of natural science. I think they should learn elementary aspects of computer science so that they're in a position, they have enough knowledge base as well as um, logical thinking and skills to make well-informed choices about um, the digital world that surrounds them so pressingly and intimately. And practically for you, is that influencing the curriculum at the national level? Yeah, absolutely it is. I mean, as I say, it's completely transformed. Before it said you should learn about digital technology. Now it says all children should learn the fundamental principles of computer science, which is a huge challenge for schools. If you're a primary teacher, you might, yeah. you know, you might think computer science. I mean, at the time it was put in the national curriculum, you know, we were not long past the time when people thought, well, computer science, that's just a university course, isn't it? Yeah. And then suddenly we say, oh, no, primary school children should have some elementary understanding. In the same way they have, an, you know, their understanding of physics is not very deep or biology, yes. right? But, they, but a primary school teacher sees themselves as, you know, part of their task is to give an elementary understanding of natural science. And so, so it's a big challenge there because um, – we, uh, it, it's easy enough to say uh, children should get an elementary understanding of the principles of computer science and should have practical experience of writing programs, um, because that's that's like the lab work of the subject, if you like. It's, it's yeah, uh, programming is the computer science as lab work is the physics. You know, it's really important. Um, yeah, it's easy enough to say that, but to turn it into a practical reality, you've got to say, well, okay, so specifically, what should children learn at primary school? And how should they learn it? In what order should they learn the concepts? Um, and uh, and, all, and then, you know, even once you've got that all laid out, you've got to, then got to say, and how can we train teachers to be good at doing that? Right. Um, same at secondary that school. That seems like one of the hardest tasks. Yeah. So, so it is. So, the, you know, the, ever since 2000, this became part of the national curriculum, which was in 2014, um, Computing at school, this sort of guerrilla um, movement in in partnership with the BCS, the, the Professional Society for Computing in this country, B, um, the British Computer Society, Chartered Institute for IT. Have been, we've been working together to answer all of those questions. Um, and the government, uh, having changed the curriculum, then waited five years, but eventually they did, hooray, um, uh, find some money, actual money, to... <laughs> build something called the National Centre for Computing Education, which is a national teacher professional development organisation aimed at upskilling teachers and generating the teaching resources and materials and curriculum sort of sequencing um, that we were discussing. So that's amazing. That was that started in 2018. I became its first chair. Oh, wow. Um, it's still, it's so, still, uh, and it's on its second iteration now, and I hope that there will be a third. Impressive. So quite a lot has taken place in this country, which is not to say job done, <laughs> uh, not at all to say job done, because um, it's a big job, right, too. Um, we are far from the, the, the place in which every child gets a great computing education. Yeah. Um, but but and that's, than we were. Uh, circling back to why the audience for this podcast might, uh, I, I would like to say, might be interested, I, but and I and I would I would like to say should be interested is that I think this task the one that I've just described about saying what should we teach exactly uh, you know when and how um, and with what materials um, all of that is too important um, to and too difficult just to leave to school teachers to make up for themselves or even from some even if government funded Quango like the National Centre for Music Education I think we as a technical community should be involved as individuals and our companies should be kind of institutionally involved in trying to make computing education into just great across the whole country in every classroom. Okay, so I would understand if I want to if I want to move verse forward in some way, I would go and download it, write some code in it, or download the paper and try implementing it. Yeah. How do I but I have no idea how I would get involved in moving the education of children in computing forwards in the way you're describing? How would yeah. someone get started in that project? Yeah. Um, so there are, uh, uh, I can give you the first step, is join CAS, right? Um, computing at school. 
Um, kind of, it, it, uh, many of the members of CAS are teachers, but um, there's uh, also, you know, a third to a half are um, IT professionals of one kind. Or okay. Other. Um, and then there are various sort of thematic interest groups. There's one on AI and there's one on primary that you could um, join. Um, and um, uh, so joining CASM, is, uh, you won't go to the CAS National Conference, just becoming better informed about it. There's probably a, um, a CAS local community, a sort of physical getting together of teachers in your area. So going to one of those would mean you face-to-face -face met with some actual live teachers who are grappling with this stuff because for me it's it's not so much about um doing some grand national scale thing i think what we as individuals and even companies do is just get stuck in locally that means yeah. that means meeting teachers and not saying no i'm going to tell you what to do but getting on that alongside them and saying i can see you've got a you know a a a um a exciting but challenging job here right how could i help you yeah um, yeah is there any way in which i could be helpful and there is a way in which I can help without necessarily being in a room of 30 children. <laughs> yeah, for example, you could be a, um, there's a, uh, you might be a, a mentor to a teacher, or mm. possibly sometimes a mentor to a, a child, particularly at the later stages, like a sixth form. Um, yeah, yeah. So CAS has a number of ways for um, professionals to get involved in, in this kind of thing. I wish I could be, I wish it was, uh, oh, you can become a STEM ambassador. Uh, what are STEM ambassadors? So that's, um, uh, you can just Google for STEM ambassador, but basically it means someone who's sort of on a, you know, a national register of people who are willing to help in some way. And schools will, when they're looking for speakers, will often look for STEM ambassadors. And oh, also okay. when you're a STEM ambassador, they will also do the, all the um, CRB checks that mean that you are, uh, you know, all the legal obligations are done so you can, you can go to a school. Right in person. Right. <laughs> yeah, they have restrictions um, on that quite sensibly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So, and all that is kind of done by being a um, by becoming a STEM ambassador. So, um, it's 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 really hard to give you a crisp answer for how to get involved because education is complicated and schools are different. Um, but when you you're, you're saying you've got children and they're at a particular school. You could do worse than find who is who is the head of computing in the school. Say, could I come and talk to you about what you're doing? And you know. Can we can we talk about you know is there any way in which I or perhaps perhaps by recruiting others you know, to, to the task could be helpful and it might be anything from well just come and give a talk about um, what what you do in your life yeah, right? yeah. because many children think that um, computing is all about um, uh, you know spotty youths in in uh, windowless basements staring at glowing screens right but actually yeah, it's a rich diverse um, creative discipline in which people do lots of different things and you uh, your, your you know uh, um, uh, role as a podcaster is very different to um, uh, the, the you know the spotty person in a bundleless room uh, writing <laughs> Weird, weird code, really, right? Really you're you're a professional really. communicator, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, the, the computing is a very diverse profession. Um, uh, so that's yeah. one one thing that a teacher could find helpful, right? Because they want to give their – if they say to their children, look, it's an interesting and diverse profession, their kids will go, yeah, 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 right? But when a person comes – and can speak in a yeah. you know persuasive and articulate way about the richness of the subject and all the things you could do, um, that's much more compelling. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, final question, because this is an international podcast. Is um, are there? Do you know if there are equivalent um, organisations in, say, America? Oh yeah, there, yeah, around definitely all around the world. So, um, yeah. so just to say, CAS is UK centric, but you can definitely join CAS from anywhere right so i have quite a few international members so that's and that just means you have access to you know you can talk to other members of the community it, it's we call it a community of practice right it's but think of it like here, here's here's a good model it's like an open source project right so right if you if you uh, i don't know subscribe to the economist you pay them a subscription in exchange for a service if you join the ghc open source project you don't pay anything you bring the contributions that you have, um, which you give for free, and in exchange you get the um, you know richness of the community that there. You get to you know get all of the free stuff that that group of people has produced. Right. Mm. So it's not it's the one is a transactional exchange, the other is more a um, shared community grassroots bottom up um, gift economy. Yes, CAS is the gift economy model, right? 
very much. It's not a subscription you pay to get a service. You just become part of a community. Um, and then, and of course, that means you make of it uh, what you can. Um, so going back to your international question, so so people abroad can um, uh, you know can still join CAS, and, and anywhere there will be a local version, and we'll probably you know if you're in a particular country and you need help finding out who, then I can probably help you because I've talked to people in lots of different countries at various times. But in America, there's something called the Computer Science Teachers Association. Um, CSTA, okay. which is a sort of equivalent of CAS, a little bit more teacher centric than than CAS is, but um, sort of equivalent of CAS in the USA. Uh, and I think in every country there would be this activists who are busy trying to do exactly what CAS is trying to do here. Cool. Okay, I'll put links to all of that in the show notes, and hopefully some listeners will get involved. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. I mean, I think it. I do think it's a it's exciting and rewarding because. Everybody cares about education, right? You can't find a person on the planet who says, well, education, who cares? Just doesn't matter, right? <laughs> well, maybe there are a few, but not many, uh, right? So, um, and also for everybody listening to this podcast, you probably think, um, you know, computer science, programming, this whole world, this is just the most exciting thing. That's why I've devoted my professional life to it. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, happily, it's well paid as well, right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, so I just want to share that. Oh, and you also have a strong idea of the, you know, the richness and depth and excitement of the discipline. I want to share that with our young people so that they don't get the wrong idea and so that they do have plenty of input and opportunities to, you know, find good on ramps into computing as a, you know, so, so that all of them end up well informed, able to make good judgments. And some yeah. of them end up, um, particularly underrepresented groups like women. Uh, find a you know find a, a, a pathway into computing as a discipline um, because I think we need lots of people there, um, and the better informed the better. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we need to help. We need to help. We can't just leave it to the education system to do. They yeah. they've got the message. They're trying hard, but they're educators. Right? <laughs> they they need the subject. They need subject expertise, and that's us. That's us. Yeah. Good. Okay, ideas and education—a perfect note to end on. Yeah, great. <laughs> Simon Payton Jones, okay, thank right. you very much for talking to us. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Bye. Simon, thank you very much. If you want to get involved in CAS in the UK or CSTA over in the States, there are links to those organizations in the show notes. And if you're not in those countries, but you know of a similar organization in your country, please drop me a line. I'll gladly add the links for wherever we can. Uh, how do you drop me a line? You look in the show notes, my contact details. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon. You can leave a comment if you're on YouTube. You can leave a like if you're on YouTube, a rating if you're on one of the audio ones. You can subscribe and rejoin us next week, or you can share with a friend and share the love and knowledge. Um, what else is there to say? I have started at scratching out an evaluator for functional logic programming in PureScript, of all things. I make no claims about how far I get, but it's good brain food and I've been enjoying it. So if you want to do something similar, you'll find a link to Simon's paper that explains it pretty well for an academic paper, very well for an academic paper in the show notes. And that should give you plenty of brain food. And if you want it, plenty of homework until next week. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins. This has been Developer Voices with Simon Peyton Jones. Thanks for listening.